Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. Up until now, the solids we've been using are infinite, but in real life we have finite solids, which have surfaces that we have yet to deal with. And if that's okay with everyone, we're going to continue to ignore surfaces. Instead, our goal today is to treat finite solids as periodic structures macroscopically. Use that to explain the discreteness of our Q vectors, and introduce a term called the density of states and explore its implications. That's quite a bit to cover. Let's start with our standard 1D chain that has n number of cells of length A and total length L, and bend it into a ring. Now we don't have any exposed surfaces. Okay, now let's recall that we already defined a traveling waveform for the displacement wave UN. This periodic structure we've invoked basically imposes the condition that U at position N must be equal to U at position N plus capital N and N plus 2 capital N and so on. So for that to be true, our exponential terms for N and N plus capital N must be equal. Dividing out E to the I omega T term, we're left with E to the I Q N A equals 1. And by inspection, our Q vectors must be equal to 2 pi over capital N times A, all of that times an integer we denote as N sub I. This integer N I is fairly important because it denotes how many modes we have in the crystal. We also see that our Q vectors are related to our reciprocal lattice vectors times our prefactor. And since we know Q is bounded by minus pi over A to pi over A for unique solutions, how will Ni be bounded? Well, we have an equation for Q in terms of Ni. So after some plug and chug, we get that ni is bounded by minus capital N over 2 to capital N over 2. Since there is a unique mode at each ni, and ni is an integer, the total number of modes is always equal to the number of cells in our 1D crystal. With this we can conclude that vibrational modes are not only discrete and bounded by a range of values, but a finite solid can only support so many modes. As an example, Let's say I have a 1D chain of 5 atoms. Because Ni is an integer, it would be bounded from minus 2 to 2, with 5 modes total. How would our Q space look? Well, we know Q is 2 pi over capital N times A, all of that times some integer Ni, and that Na is the total length L. So there would be one mode every 2 pi over L in Q space. But the edge of Q space is at pi over A, and we know A is L over N, so the edge of our Q line would be at capital N pi over L. Okay, so five atoms is probably a bit short. Let's consider a 1D sample that's one centimeter long. How would the spacing in Q between allowed modes compare to the five atom case? It would shrink considerably because of the inverse relationship with L. Exactly, and assuming our unit cell is the same size, our Brillouin zone st also stays the same size. So because of the smaller spacing between modes, we have considerably more modes in the centimeter long sample. Let's see exactly how many. For a crystal with a unit cell about a nanometer long and a sample length of one centimeter, we should be able to get an order of magnitude estimate. Looks like we'd have approximately 10 to the seventh modes. So although we've been drawing our dispersion as a continuous line, it's actually made up of a discrete amount of points. But with 10 to the seventh points, it'll pretty much look like a continuous line. Yeah, that's a lot of zeros. And that about wraps up the discreteness of Q space. Now we want to move on to the second part of today's screencast and talk about the density of states. Ultimately, we want to be able to discuss material properties, but we can't talk about that until we know the energy levels of our system. Rather than thinking about all the individual vibrational modes, it's good to be able to bin them into energy levels. And that's where the density of states comes in. The density of states tells us the number of modes at a particular energy. To see this a bit clearer, let's look at a 1D chain of 9 atoms. What would its dispersion look like? Well, we already know it should have a signed shape, but instead of a line, we fill it with discrete points with one at the origin and four on either side as so. Recall that the spacing between points is 2 pi over L. Nicole, you might want to be careful. Your dispersion relationship is in terms of omega, and we want energy. 
Right, but if we're treating phonons as quantum oscillators, we know that energy equals h bar omega, so I'll just keep things in terms of omega, so it's one less variable to keep track of. Now we'll break up the omegas into four different blocks, and it's pretty obvious how many states are in each block. True, but let's be more explicit. Let's plot the number of states versus omega. So there are more phonons at higher energies since the density is higher. Careful here. We never said anything about the population of phonons. The density of states describes how many modes are at a particular energy level. It's completely independent of how many phonons exist in these particular modes. How would we do this for the 10 to the 7th mode case? I certainly don't want to count all those states. Well, in a way we will. It's just a little bit more complicated. If we look at our dispersion for this case, we ultimately want to know the number of points in a given delta q and in a given delta omega. The number of points in a delta q would just be the length in q divided by the point spacing, which we know for 1d is 2 pi over l. But then we need to account for the minus q vectors, so we multiply our expression by 2, and now we get the points in q as l over pi times this delta q. Yeah, and that's going to give us a portion of the dispersion relation. Now we'll invoke that the corresponding points in omega are just our density of states times delta omega. Setting those equal, we can explicitly solve for z, where z is our density of states. But we want to get rid of this delta q business, because we want to integrate only over omega. So we can just sub in the group velocity here, since it's equal to delta omega over delta q. But since we have an expression for omega, we can take the derivative and get the following expression for our density of states. And yet we're still not done because we have this q floating around. We'll use the dispersion relationship to solve for q and plug that back into the expression for the density of states. After some plug and chug and some integration, we end up with a final expression for our density of states in terms of omega. And if we plot this expression over omega and compare it to the night atom case we had before, we see that they have the same form. Yeah, that's really nice. So why then does the density of states explode near the Briouan zone edge in this example? Well, it's because the slope of the dispersion approaches zero at that point. So there's also an inverse relationship between the density of states and the group velocity of these vibrations. Whew, we've covered a lot. Looks like a good time for a recap. Okay, so we've looked at finite solids and how Q-space is discrete and has a finite range. For this 1D case, the number of modes in a crystal is equal to the number of cells. The second thing we did was look at the density of states. Although we didn't touch on it today, the density of states is going to be an important factor later on in our discussion on transport. But for now, the takeaway message is that the density of states describes how vibrational modes are distributed in the energies of our system. As always, we have some questions for you at home. Today we focused on the 1D case, but density of states can easily be carried into multiple dimensions. How would you expect it to be different if we were looking at a 2D or a 3D solid? Second, we made all of these assumptions, assuming one atom on each lattice point. How would a two-atom basis change the density of states, if it does at all? Next week we're going to be talking about phonon transport and phonon properties. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you later.